It is Easter Sunday. It is the day when people around the world think about uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a day that we celebrate every Sunday, every day. For us, it's not just a once a year event. It is, 1 Peter 1, 3 says, our living hope, without which we are told. Without the resurrection of Christ, we are told our faith would be worthless. But since he has risen from the dead, we have life. We now have eternal life. Because he lives, we will live with him forever. Of course we celebrate Easter every day. But how do the events, how does all that has happened during this past week lead up to the resurrection? How does it all fit together? It can be a little confusing at times. To answer those questions, we have to go back to the, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have to look at their accounts of this past week, each writer has devoted a considerable amount of space to these events. But how do each of their accounts fit together? That can be a little confusing too, can't it? Today we hope and we pray that the Lord will give us a glimpse, that he will give us a, a fresh look an understanding of what Easter is all about and the events that led up to Easter, which are the most important sequence of events that have ever taken place on this earth. But where do we begin? Well, the celebration of Easter. The story of Easter begins with the story of Passover, the first Passover. A story that's found in Exodus chapter 12. We will be reading this morning, our scripture reading is from Exodus chapter 12. We'll be reading verses 5 through 7 and verses 12 and 13. It says there, Your lamb shall be an unblemished male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then a whole, the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat. Down to verse 12, it says, For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Let's pray. Father, we are here this morning to worship you. We are here to remember what you have done for us. We are here to celebrate your victory. We are here to celebrate your triumph over sin, over the grave. And we are here to celebrate, Lord God, that you have brought us into your family. We belong to you, Lord. And I pray this morning that that as we are together looking at your word, that you will speak to each of us. I pray that your Holy Spirit will come alongside of us and minister to us. Stir us up, comfort us, do what needs to be done in our lives, Lord, that we might give you the worship and the praise that you deserve. We pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. On Palm Sunday, 
thousands of people were on their way to Jerusalem. They were on their way to celebrate the, the Passover. They were there to remember the time when God had delivered them from their bondage in Egypt. Jesus was traveling on that same road to Jerusalem. He was coming into Jerusalem for the last time. The expectations of the people were high. They welcomed him as their Messiah, as their king, as the one th who they believed would deliver them from their problems, who would deliver them from their oppressors. Luke 19, verse 37 through 40, it says that as Jesus was approaching the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen him done. And they were shouting out and saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. It says there that some of the Pharisees were in the multitude. And they said to Jesus, Teacher, Rebuke your disciples. And Jesus said to them, if these become silent, the very stones will cry out. How could they be silent? Their king, their Messiah had come. And as Jesus entered the city, thousands of people welcomed him as their deliverer. It's only the writer, Luke, who tells us that there were Pharisees, leaders of the Jewish nation in that multitude on that day when he went into the city. The religious leaders were there. They were watching and they were waiting. They were listening. They were observing everything that was happening. And though they taught that the Messiah would come. And though they claimed that they were waiting for the Messiah to come, and though Jesus had fulfilled hundreds of Old Testament prophecies proving that he was, in fact, the Messiah, and though they had seen him perform incredible miracles which validated his words that he was the Messiah, still, they wouldn't believe him. They wouldn't believe he was the anointed one who had come from heaven. They refused to believe the evidence that was right in front of them. They rejected him as their Lord, as their King, as their Savior. Luke 19, 41, it says that Jesus looked out over the city of Jerusalem and he wept. He wept for the people. He wept for the people who were about to reject him as their savior. He wept for them because he knew that by rejecting him, they were rejecting eternal life with him. The leaders of the nation of Israel had rejected their king. Six days after Jesus rode into the city, early Friday morning, sometime between 1 a.m. and 5 a.m., they had Jesus arrested and brought to them. They questioned him. They were looking for some reason to put him to death. They brought in false witnesses. The false witnesses couldn't even agree on their false testimony. No one could be found. No one could be found who could give a testimony of anything that Jesus had said or done that was wrong. No lies, no deceit, no bad behavior, no inappropriate words. Nothing could be found to be brought against him. Nothing. Exodus 12 verse 5 says, your lamb shall be an unblemished lamb. Christ was that 
unblemished lamb. So there he stands, the lamb of God, standing before these men. He stands in integrity, in holiness. He stands trusting in his father who is in heaven. They mocked him. They lied about him. The whole time, we're told in Matthew 26, 63, he kept silent. He didn't say a word. The leaders were becoming frustrated. They couldn't find a reason to put him to death. So finally, Luke 22, 70, they ask him point blank, are you the son of God? Answer the question. Answer the question as you stand before the God of heaven. Who are you? The response of Jesus is, is simple, but it is very powerful. He says, yes, I am. I am the son of God. Not only was Jesus claiming to be their king... Not only was he claiming to be their Messiah, he was claiming to be God. They'd had enough. They had, they'd made their decision. Matthew 26, 66 says, they said, you, you're worthy of death. And they spit on him. And they hit him. And they punched him. Slapped him. That's what we do. When we reject Jesus Christ as our Savior, we spit in his face. You know, they could mock him. They could beat him. They could spit on him. But the nation of Israel was under the authority of the Roman Empire. Only the Romans had the authority to execute a person who was convicted in a Jewish trial. You know, but the Romans weren't interested in religious disputes uh, among the Hebrews. They weren't interested in a Messiah or a prophet. What they were interested in is keeping the order. They wanted order kept among the people that they had conquered, and they would put down any rebellion against their authority with speed and with brutality. The Jewish leaders would have to bring Jesus before the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. They would have to convince him that Jesus was a threat to them, to Rome. It was about 5 a.m. Friday morning. Matthew 23, 1 says that the whole body of them went to Pilate. They all went to the governor's residence located inside Fort Antonia, just north of the temple. And they stood there and they accused Jesus... John 18, 29, Pilate asks them, what accusation do you bring against this man? Pilate hasn't handled himself very well as governor in Judea over the past four or five years. Uh, he's made some pretty poor decisions along the way. Example, he had his soldiers carry the image of Caesar through the streets of Jerusalem. He knew that it would upset the Jewish people. He deliberately did it. He decided to build an aqueduct, uh, a water system. He didn't have the money, so he took the money from the temple treasury. And when the people rioted, he sent soldiers out into the, the streets disguised as citizens to kill them. He slaughtered them, and then he took their blood and used it as part of his pagan sacrifice. He had the image of the emperor put on the shields of his guards. This time the Jewish people didn't bother to talk to him. They went right to the emperor. And the emperor demanded that he remove the shields in order to keep peace. Rome was aware that Pilate was unable to uh, use sound judgment to keep these people under control without some sort of violent consequence. And so now he proceeds very carefully very slowly, as these Jewish leaders bring Jesus before him, he wants to know the specific charges that were being brought against this Jewish rabbi. Luke 23, 2, they make their case. They say, we, 
we have found this man misleading our nation of forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, of saying that he is the Christ, a king. They charged him with inciting the people to rebel against Roman authority, of disrupting tax collection, of claiming to be a political leader working in opposition to the emperor. The charge was sedition, rebellion. A charge that, if they could prove, would be punishable by crucifixion. In response to their indictments, Pilate decides to question Jesus himself. Matthew 27, 11, he asks them point blank. He says, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus responds, it is as you say. John gives us a little more information. John chapter 18, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. He said, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting for me so that I would not be delivered up to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this world. This man is no threat to Rome. If he's a king, where's his kingdom? If he's a king, where's his army? So Pilate decides to send him to King Herod. Jesus was a Galilean. He was in Herod's jurisdiction. Herod was in town for the Passover. So he sent him to Herod. Herod and his soldiers mocked him, sent him back to Pilate. This whole time, Jesus remained silent. Doesn't say a word. Matthew 27, 14 says, he did not answer him in regard to even a single charge so that the governor was quite amazed. Pilate had reached his verdict. It seemed obvious. John 18, 38, he says, I find no guilt in him. The man's innocent of the charges that you've brought against him. He's not a revolutionary. He, he doesn't advocate civil disobedience. He's not guilty of sedition. And then in Luke 23, 14, he addresses these leaders. And he says, you've brought this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion. And behold, having examined him before you, I find no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you have brought before him. To help reduce the tension, the resentment among the people, the custom was that a prisoner would be released during the Passover feast. It was a gesture of goodwill on the part of the Romans. And there was a prisoner that was being held, being held for execution. His name was Barabbas. He was a robber. He was a murderer. He was an insurrectionist. He was not a patriot. He was a threat, not only to the Romans. He was a threat to the Jewish people. Matthew 27, 17, Pilate asks the people, whom do you want released? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? Who should I release? You choose. You make the decision. The crowd, the crowd cries for Barabbas. Barabbas is freed, according to the custom of the Romans at the Passover. But think about it. Pilate had already made the decision that Jesus was innocent. Jesus should have been released as well. But amazingly, Pilate decides to ask the crowd what should be done. And they cry out, let him be crucified. It's not justice that Pilate's looking for. He, he's, he's trying to avert the threat of a riot. Another riot might be the loss of his job. Might be the loss of his career. Might be the loss of his life. To keep the people from rioting, to appease the Jewish leaders, he decides to give the people what they want. Then he does something very interesting, very unusual, especially for a Roman. He publicly washes his hands. Do you ever wonder why he did that? That was a Jewish custom. What's he doing? He's not Jewish, he's a Roman. 
It was a custom that the elders of Israel used. When they couldn't find the identity of a murderer, justice couldn't be rendered. They had tried, but they couldn't find the one who had committed the crime, so they publicly washed their hands in front of the people as if to say, we have tried to render justice. We have been unable to do so. We are innocent of this man's blood who has been murdered. So he washes his hands. Pilate washes his hands, and he says in Matthew 27, I am innocent of this man's blood. Justice? Justice won't be rendered here today for this man. And so they released Barabbas. But Jesus, we're told, Matthew 27, 26, they scourged. Scourging was a punishment. It was a punishment that was inflicted on prisoners, usually before crucifixion. Familiar with the scourge? A scourge is a whip, a small whip with a wooden handle with long leather strips attached to it. On the end of the strips are pieces of bone. Sharp pieces of metal. Two soldiers administered this torture. The one to be punished was tied to a post. His hands were lifted up into the air. His feet were dangling off the ground. And then the two soldiers took turns whipping him across his shoulders and his back and his sides. It wasn't too long before the flesh was torn away, before the muscle was torn away, before the tendons were torn away. It wasn't too long before veins and arteries were severed and the blood was pouring out profusely. The pain was unimaginable. At times, even internal organs were exposed, like the kidneys and the spleen. They were ripped open. Many people who suffered this torture didn't even make it to be crucified. They died from scourging. Then, we're told, the soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium, the barracks. They called out the battalion, 600 men. They surrounded Jesus. They took off his robe. They put on a scarlet robe. They put a reed in his right hand. They kneeled before him and they bowed and said, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spit on him. They took the reed and beat him on his head. They had put a crown of thorns, two-inch thorns on his head. They beat the crown into his head. And then, we are told in John, John chapter 19, they brought him back to Pilate. They brought him back to stand before the people. The same people who had welcomed him into Jerusalem and declared him as their king. The same people who had seen him perform miracles. The same people that he may have healed. And Pilate says in John, Behold the man. The chief priests say, Crucify. Crucify him. Pilate said again, I find no fault in him. Listen to their response. They said, we have a law, and by our law, he ought to die because he made himself out to be the son of God. He claims he's God. He claims he's king. And they said, if you release him, you are no friend of Caesar because everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. A little bit we know about Pilate. What do you think he did? He caves. It was too much for him. Matthew 27, 31, it says, they led Jesus away to crucify him. Mark 15, 25 tells us that it was the third hour when they crucified him, 9 a.m. in the morning. But remember, they didn't have wristwatches. They didn't have clocks. So it is somewhere between 9 and 12 o'clock. And then they just simply say they crucified him. No details. Well, crucifixion didn't originate with the Romans, you know. It was the Persians. The Romans just borrowed it. And everybody knew what it was, not just because they had heard about it. 
There were hundreds of men who lined the streets. Men who had been crucified by the Romans. We're told by this time, 30,000 Jews had been crucified. They had been killed in that way. The prisoner would be guarded by four soldiers. He would be led through the street until he got outside the city. The prisoner would carry a wooden cross or he would carry the cross beam. A sign would be placed around his neck describing the charges that were being brought against him so people wouldn't commit those same crimes and end up in the same place. A sign around Jesus' neck was written in Hebrew, Aramaic, in Greek, in Latin. It simply said, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. That was the reason that was given for his death. The sign, the same sign was then placed above his head when he was crucified. You know, crucifixion was a form of punishment. It was really a form of torture. It was designed to inflict the, the maximum amount of pain and suffering for the maximum amount of time. Six inch spikes were driven into his wrists onto the crossbeam. His nails, his feet were nailed to the upright beam. The cross was then dropped into the ground. And as it dropped into the ground, it tore the wounds. Death was slow and painful. You know, sometimes it could take a week for somebody to die of crucifixion. It could take days. His lungs would fill with air, but he couldn't exhale. So he had to push up and move a little bit just to try to exhale. But every time he did that, there would be excruciating pain. He would suffocate to death. He didn't die from the wounds. Along with Jesus, we are told, Matthew 27, there were two others who were crucified. Two robbers, we're told. Two listes in Greek. These aren't just robbers. These are men who tortured and who many times killed the people that they were robbing. These were bad guys. To the Romans, these were just three more prisoners. Just three more executions. Matthew 27, 36 says that they sat down to watch him die. They didn't know who he was and they didn't care. They were just doing their job. In response to them, Jesus speaks his first words from the cross. Luke chapter 23, verse 34, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know that they are crucifying the Son of God. Father, forgive them. There's no anger. There's no hate. There's no resentment. There's only the offer of forgiveness. How can we do anything less? Jesus was crucified on a road, near a road, outside the city gates. It was a public place. There were people coming and going. Matthew 27, 39 says there were those who were passing by. Crowds of people coming in and out of the city for the Passover. People who would have seen his miracles. People who would have heard him teach. But Matthew says they were blaspheming him. They were insulting him, shaking their heads and yelling at him, saying, you, you who would destroy the temple in three days? and then rebuild it? Save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. They're like a lot of people today. They're just passing by. They may know about Jesus. They may go to church. They may be baptized. But they really don't believe. They make their comments. They give their opinions but they don't give evidence that Christ is in their life. They are just passing by. Matthew 27 says that in the same way, there were the chief priests and the elders, the rulers, the scribes. It said they were there too. But you know, they didn't actually address Jesus. They were just standing there, we're told, mocking him and saying, he saved others. 
He can't save himself. If he is the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross. We'll believe him. These are the religious experts. The people who think they know the Bible. But they don't know Christ. They think they have knowledge, but they don't have the true knowledge of a relationship with Jesus Christ. They are leaders whom the people respect, but they are the blind leading the blind. One of the robbers who was crucified with Jesus sees all of this unfolding before him. And as he's dying, he realizes that Jesus is an innocent man. He doesn't deserve to be there. In fact, maybe he is the Messiah. Maybe he is the king. Maybe he is the savior sent from heaven. But he realizes something even more important. He realizes that Jesus is his king and his Messiah and his only way to heaven. And he says to Jesus in Luke 23, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replies with his second words from the cross. Luke 23, 43, he says, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The last hours of this man's life, as his life is slipping away, he has hours, maybe minutes to live. God reaches out to him and saves him. What mercy! That's the same mercy that he offers to each one of us today. So where are the disciples? Where are the disciples while all this is going on? What's happened to them? Where have they gone? Well, the night that Jesus was betrayed, remember Matthew 26, 31, it says, Jesus speaks to them and says, this night, this very night, you will all fall away because of me. He says, for it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Through his trial, through his pain, through his suffering, where are the disciples? Where are the disciples who claimed just hours before that they would rather die with him than ever desert him. Some of us know that shame. Some of us know that failure. We remember when we have run instead of standing with Jesus. We know that. We've experienced it. We know how we have shamed him. And now we know that we are but dust. We know that it is by his grace alone that we stand. So now... At the cross, one of those disciples steps forward. It's John. He steps forward with Mary, the mother of Jesus. And here we have the third words of Jesus from the cross. He looks down at them. John chapter 19, verse 26. And he says, woman, behold your son. To John, he says, behold your mother. Even as he is dying, in excruciating pain, he reaches out with compassion and with love to this woman. That is our Savior. But now everything shifts. The whole focus shifts. Jesus is no longer looking at the people around him. He's no longer concerned about them. Something has happened. Something uh, that is really, it defies our understanding. Matthew 27, 45, we are told from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, darkness fell upon the land. 12 noon to 3 p.m., it says, the land, the gi in Greek, the earth was covered with darkness. Luke 23, 45 tells us that the sun was ekipo in Greek. It failed. It ceased to exist on the earth. What happened 
Don't tell me it was an eclipse. There were no eclipses at that time, at that particular point in the calendar. So it wasn't an eclipse. What was it? We don't know. How far did it extend over the land? We don't know that either. That's not the point. More importantly, we have heard from men. Now we have heard from heaven. There is darkness. Divine judgment is about to fall on the Son of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. He literally became our sin. Our sin, our judgment fell on the sinless Son of God. Do you get it? I don't. Do you get what's involved in that? I don't. Habakkuk 1.13 says, Thine eyes are too pure to approve evil. And thou canst not look on wickedness with favor. We'll never understand what happened between 12 noon and 3 p.m. on that day. God the Father turned away from God the Son, his beloved Son, our Savior, as he took on the weight of our sin and he became sin. Get it? I don't. I don't get it. But I do know that I will never have to experience the horror of that as Christ did. Those of us who know Christ will never have to be separated from God our Father. So then, Jesus speaks his fourth words from the cross. Matthew 27, 46, he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Ekatalipo in Greek. Why have you deserted me? Why have you abandoned me? Can you answer that question? If you were standing there at the foot of the cross, how would you respond to Christ? What would be your answer? You know, our answer will determine where we will spend eternity. What is the answer? For me, Lord, your father has forsaken you for me, for my sin. That's why he can't look on you. That's why he has abandoned you, for me. What was your answer? It will determine where you spend eternity. John 19, 28, it says that Jesus, knowing that all things had been accomplished in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, He's fulfilling scripture. He's dying. He's fulfilling scripture. He says, I am thirsty. His fifth words from the cross. All of the prophecies concerning the Messiah have been fulfilled or are being fulfilled except one. Psalm 69, verse 21. He knew that. And so he says, Psalm 69, 29 says, and they gave me gall to drink. And when I was thirsty, they gave me vinegar. And now, even that scripture is being fulfilled. So he can say those words in John 19. It is finished. It is accomplished. His six words from the cross. They're not words of defeat. They're words of victory. They're words of triumph. The work that he has been given to do it's accomplished. It's done. It's complete. Our sin is paid for. Satan is defeated. And with his final breath, he speaks his last words. Luke 23, 46, he says, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Exodus 12, verse 6. We read that the people killed the Passover lamb at twilight sometime between 3 p.m. and 5 p.m. It had become the custom to kill the Passover lamb at 3 in the afternoon. As the people are offering up an animal sacrifice in the temple, at that moment, 
the Son of God, the Lamb of God, is offering up himself as a sacrifice for us. He knew it. He released his life. It says he, he chose the moment of his death. John 10, 17 and 18, he said, I lay down my life that I might take it up again. I lay it down of my own initiative. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. At the exact moment of time, he chose to lay down his life. Who can do that but God? Well, maybe it's a more important question. Why did he have to do that? Why was all this necessary? I mean, if it wasn't necessary, why did he come to do it in the first place? Why did he have to die? In the Old Testament, the reason is given in Leviticus 17, 11. In the New Testament, it's given in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. It says there, the life of the flesh is in the blood, and without the pouring out of blood, there can be no forgiveness for sin. What was the Passover feast about? It was a celebration of God's deliverance. It was a time to remember what? When the lamb was killed and the blood was placed on the doorpost and the lentil. Exodus 12, 13, God said, When I see the blood, I will pass over you. When God sees the blood of Christ, applied to our lives, our lives, he passes over us. We are saved. We are delivered. We are saved by the blood of Christ and nothing else. For Peter, 1 Peter 1, 19, Peter knew it. He said, we're saved with precious blood. He said, as of a lamb, unblemished, and spotless, the blood of Christ, it is finished. Matthew 27, verses 57 through 63, we find out it was evening. Jesus is dead at some time between 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. And a man named Joseph comes to Pilate and he asks for the body of Jesus. So it's a little unusual. Criminals who were executed by crucifixion, they were usually thrown in the garbage dump on the southern end of Jerusalem and burned. Or they were put in an open grave so the animals and the birds could devour them. But this man, Joseph, he received permission. He took the body of Jesus. He prepared it for burial. He put it in his tomb. He had the door shut with a huge stone. The next day, we're told, Matthew tells us, the chief priests, the elders, came to the Romans and they asked that a guard be posted in front of this tomb. They were afraid. They were afraid that the disciples would come and steal the body of Jesus. And then they would claim that he had risen from the dead. How did they know that? It says, because he said it. They remembered what the disciples seemed to have forgotten. Jesus said he would rise from the dead. Ask people about Jesus. Ask them. What will they say? He's a, he was a good teacher. He was a good man. He was a good example, an example of selfless love and sacrifice. They'll commend him for the courage that he had when he died. But the message that continues to be attacked is the message of the resurrection. Why? Because Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 3, we are born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We know our sins have been paid for by his blood. How do we know? Because he has risen from the dead. That is the evidence that his sacrifice for us has been accepted by God. And that is what really happened on Easter. God, the Father, accepted the sacrifice of the Son for us. The king has been revealed. The king has been rejected. Now the king has risen. Matthew 28, verse 1, it says, Late on the Sabbath, it began to dawn towards the first day of the week. The Sabbath would have ended, 6 p.m., Saturday night. Now it's early Sunday morning. It's dark, verse 1 says, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. Mary, 
Mary Magdalene was a woman who Jesus had cast out seven de demons. We remember her. But it says the other Mary, that is the mother of two of the disciples. And they're on their way to the tomb. Mark and Luke tell us there were other women there. Matthew mentions two of them. Mark 16, verse 3, we, we are let in on what they were talking about while they were on their way to the tomb. It says there they were wondering, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? They'd come with spices. They'd come to anoint the body of Jesus. The question has already been answered. Matthew 28, verse 2, it says, Behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone. The tomb is empty. Mary Magdalene's upset. She doesn't understand why the tomb is empty. Where have they taken her Lord? John 20, verse 2 says she ran back to the disciples to let them know the tomb is empty. The Lord's not there. The other women stayed at the tomb. But they have the same question. Where have they laid the body of Jesus? They're about to get the answer to that question. Verse 2, Matthew 28. It says, this angel who rolled away the stone sat on it. He's sitting there. He's sitting on a stone which would have taken several men to move, to put in place. He rolled it away all by himself. And he's just sitting there. He's shining, he's glistening, it says, with the glory of God. Hebrews 1, 7 says, his angels are a flame of fire. And Matthew describes his appearance. He says, the appearance of this angel was like lightning. His garment was as white as snow. The guards knew he wasn't a local resident. We know that. Matthew 28, 4, we are told the guards shook for fear of him. They were afraid. They were terrified. Seo in Greek, the same root word as the word for earthquake. They shook violently with fear. And then it says they became like dead men. They were paralyzed. These are battle-hardened soldiers, men who have faced the enemy, men who have faced difficulties in battle, but they're traumatized with fear. They can't even look at this, this messenger from heaven. And as these guards are lying there on the ground, frozen like dead men, this angel speaks to the women. Verse 5, it says he answered, he explained to them what was going on. What is going on? They've come to anoint a dead body. There is no dead body to anoint. He said to them, don't be afraid. Better translation. Stop being afraid. They were already afraid. He says, I know you're looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He's not here. Why? For he is risen. Just as he said, good news, he's alive. Why should you be surprised? Everything has happened exactly as he said it would. It seems nobody took the words of Jesus seriously, did they? I don't think much has changed today. He said he'd rise from the dead. He said it would be the third day. It is the third day. And then the angel invites these women into the tomb. He wants them to come in and have them take a look for themselves. He says, verse 6, come and see where the Lord was lying. The tomb is empty. He's not there. He's risen. That is the message of Easter. The tomb is empty. He is risen. So now these women have the privilege of being the first to announce this good news. The angel gives them their assignment, our assignment, really. Verse 7, he says, go quickly and tell his disciples. Where are the disciples? Well, they're hiding out. Uh, they're, they're afraid. They might be the next ones to be arrested and crucified. 
They're discouraged. They're ashamed. They've deserted their Lord. They're in misery. They're in grief. They're confused. Now what do they do? And so the Lord gives them words of comfort and of hope and of joy. And that is what he does to us. He gives us those words of comfort and hope and of joy. And the message, verse 7, he says, tell the disciples he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you into Galilee and you will see him there. Behold, I have told you, not only is he alive, but you are going to see him for yourselves. To the women, he says, I've given you this information. Now it's up to you to deliver the message. That's our assignment. It is up to us to deliver the message. Go, he says, go quickly. And they did, verse 8. It says, they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and with great joy. And they didn't walk. Verse 8 says, they ran to the disciples. But as they are running, Matthew says, behold, verse 9, Jesus met them and greeted them. Now, not only do they have the words of an angel, not only have they seen the empty tomb, but now they have seen their risen Lord face to face. Suddenly, he's standing there right in front of them. And now, they are eyewitnesses to the truth of the resurrection. And verse 9 says, they came up to him. They fell down before him. They took hold of his feet. And they did the only thing that they could do. They did the only thing that any of us can do who know Jesus Christ. It says that they worshipped him. And that is the message of Easter. Rejoice and never forget that he is Lord, he is King, he is God, and he is risen. Let's pray. Lord God, the events that have taken place are beyond our understanding. We are, in a sense, bystanders and witnesses to all of this, except for the fact that you have touched our hearts and you have given us light. You have given us knowledge in our hearts that what has been said is true and comes from you. And we believe, Lord, that you are our Christ and our Lord and our God. And Lord God, we love you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for opening up our eyes. You are alive. You are in our hearts. But you have asked us to remember you. Those of us who know you, you have said, we are to remember you in your death. That we are to remember that your body was given for us. That your blood was poured out for us. And as we, Lord God, do that today, we rejoice in you, Lord, our God of our salvation. Father, touch our hearts. Help us to be like those women. Help us to go. Help us to go quickly. And help us with boldness to bring the message that you have risen from the dead. And you are our Lord. We ask these things in Jesus Christ our Savior, in his name. Amen.